uh, noticeable speakers. And um, of course, I want to thank the ENS, especially Anna, for her continuous support of uh, providing us with all the all that we need to have our webinar activity going on. And um, today, my co-host will uh, will be Maria Teresa Pedro from uh, Ulm, from Germany. And um, we are ready to start. So I hand over to Maria to present the first speaker. And uh, please use the question and answer for the, in the chat for the questions. There will be discussion, of course. This is what the, these webinars are living. Uh, but please, for any questions, use the chat or the question Q&A. So enjoy the evening. Maria, you are on mute. Okay, thank you, Christian, for the introduction. I would like to welcome Christian, so who will tell us on the first part something about the anatomy to start, which is very important topic, which is actually the um, most one of the most frequent entrapment syndromes after CTS. So, Christian, so we're very pleased to hear it from you, the anatomical part. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this webinar. I will open the webinar by, as you say, describing the anatomy of the cubital tunnel, and then consequently, of course, the ulnar nerve. Um, the cubital tunnel is a space of the dorsal medial elbow, which allows the passage of the ulnar nerve around the elbow. It's chronic compression. It's called a <laughs> cubital tunnel syndrome which is basically a form of repetitive strain injury similar to the carpal tunnel syndrome that we have at the wrist. Uh, first of all, so we, we're going to analyze the anatomical feature of the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve originates from the nerve roots C8 and T1, usually all these two, but occasionally also some C7 fibers, and then they form the medial cord of the brachial plexus. The medial cord gives off numerous branches before bifurcating into its two terminal branches, one giving the median nerve and the other becoming the origin of the ulnar nerve. Uh, as we can say in the picture, then the ulnar nerve courses down the arm medially to the brachial artery and then goes in the anterior muscular compartment uh, up until the insertion point of the coracobrachialis muscles. Here, it pierces the medial intermuscular septum of the arm and eventually reaches the posterior muscular compartment. Uh, one common compression site is the, uh, here at, of the nerve in this point is the arcade of strutters, as we will see later. It's not a worthy to say that the ulnar nerve gives no motor or sensor branches above the elbow. Uh, at the elbow, the ulnar nerve enters then the, cub the cubital tunnel passing posterior to the medial epicondyle, where it can be palpated by a hand. Uh, it, enters in, it enters then the anterior compartment of the forearm between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, the flexor carpi ulnaris is the most common sign of ulnar nerve compression. It's important to remember that. And then after, the, after this place, it, it travels alongside the ulna toward the weirds. Uh, staying deep to the flexor carpionaris and superficial to the flexor digitorum profundus. In the distal part of the forearm, the ulnar nerve moves lateral to the flexor carpionaris and then um, goes medially to the ulter artery uh, till the Guyon's canal. Here it enters the palm, superficial, superficial to the flexor retinaculum, and then uh, once in the palm in the hand, the nerve uh, ends with its terminal motor branches. Uh, the ulnar nerve innervates muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm and in the hand. In the anterior forearm, the muscular branch of the ulnar nerve supplies basically two important muscles, the flexor carpi ulnaris, which uh, flexes and abducts the hand at the wrist, and the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus that has the same name says, flexes the rings and the little fingers at the level of the distant interphalangeal joint. 
It's important to remember that the remaining muscles in the anterior forearm are innervated from the medial nerve instead. So uh, at the end, the majority of the intrinsic muscles are innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. Hypotenar muscles, uh, which are you, uh, the flexor digiti, flexor digiti minimi brevis, the abductor digiti minimi, and the opponent's digiti minimi, as we can say in the, in the picture, the two medial lumbricals, the abductor pollicis, and the mm, two interossi of the hand. The last one, the palmaris brevis, is usually an exception to this rule. This it's innervated by, innervated by the uh, superficial branch of the ulnar nerve. The other muscle of the nerve, lateral, uh, the lateral two lumbricals and the tenor eminence are then innervated by the median nerve. Uh, as about the sensory innervation, the ulnar nerve provides a sensory innervation to the ulnar side palmar and the dorsal aspect on the hand, as well as the small finger and the ulnar half on the ring finger. There are three branches of the ulnar nerve who are responsible for its sensory innervation. Uh, two of these arise in the forearm and then travel in the hand. The, the third one arises just in the hand. So the first one the, are the palmar cutaneous branch, which arises in the middle part of the forearm and supplies the innervation over the hypotenar eminence, so the uh, dorsal part. And then the dorsal cutaneous branches arise uh, about 7.5 centimeter above the wrist, goes backwards to the, to the wrist, and then innervates the skin of the proximal part of the, uh, the, ulnar, um, the ulnar side of, uh, of the hand. And then the ulnar, uh, I mean, and then the last two fingers, I mean, the last 1.5 fingers. And the last branch, as we said, arises in the, in the hand, and in erase the palmar surface of the these two sided fingers, as we can see in the, in the picture. So the most frequent entrapment of the ulnar nerve are five. I mean, the entrapment can occur in the five possible sides. The first is the arcade of struthers that occurs approximately 10 centimeter proximal to the medial epicondyle, the medial intermuscular septum, the medial epicondyle, the Cubit of tunnel, that's the most frequent, and then at the level of the deep flexor pronatal aponeurosis. As we say, the uh, cubit of tunnel is the most common. Uh, so, just more specifically, uh, the cubit of tunnel syndrome is uh, due to the compression of the ulnar nerve when it passes under the medial epicondyle uh, on the internal portion of the elbow. In this area, the nerve is relatively unprotected and can be trapped. Uh, between the bone and the skin. Even if it's not an actual bone, this spot is usually common, the funny bone, because when you hit the funny bone, uh, just in the right way, uh, you have actually hit the ulnar nerve itself. And then the impact caused the common typical sensation that probably everyone has experienced, at least one, of uh, tingling, num numbness, burning, or just pain along the inside of the arm. Uh, down to the ring and the little finger. The cubit of tunnel is uh, an oval shaped fibrosis space located on the posterior medial aspect of the elbow. Its ceiling is formed by the osmor ligament, that's also known as a cubital retinaculum, as we can say here in the um, B part, I mean the B circle. And the Osbor ligament is a ligament passing from the medial epicondyle to the olecranon process, connecting the humeral and the ulnar heads of the flexor carpionaris. In some patients, the ceiling of the cubital nerve is replaced by the anconeus epitrochlearis muscle, usually thought to be an accessory cause of you know, nerve compression. The tunnel floor is made up by the medial collateral ligament and the elbow joint capsule, while the medial, medial epicondyle and the olecranon form the walls at the both sides. Usually the ulnar nerve is maximal compressed between the 
Osborne ligament and the uh, medial collateral ligament in the tunnel at the um, one under more or less 135 degrees on the elbow flexion. When at this point, the tunnel height uh, and sagittal curvature is are decreased. So it's more easy to just get, could just compress the nerve. Um, it's usually suggests that the proximal distal ends of the cubital tunnel can be explored carefully to prevent incomplete release by the surgery. Uh, the cubital tunnel uh, syndrome is the most commonly reported upper extremity and trapped neuropathy. And it's the most common ulnar nerve neuropathy. Uh, it can be a result of direct or indirect trauma due to nerve uh, vulnerability in the seat, in this location. It can be classified into primary, just like, or idiopathic, it's including the anatomical variants, or secondary due to trauma, elbow arthrosis, or extra or intraneural maxes, just like lipomas or ganglions. Tractious, traction injuries can be the result of loss tangent bulging deformity. And the flexion contractors are the most common in usually in trophy athletes due to extreme bulgous stress that you that they put on the arm. Some factors leading to the common cubital tunnel syndrome include mechanical stress, direct trauma, uh, usually repetitive elbow flexion or extension, as we say, repetitive overhead activities, or um, metabolic disorders, congenital deformities, uh, joint inflammation like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and usually also diabetes and or hemophilia. And then of recent popularization is also the concept of cell phone elbow, then indeed doesn't need any more explanation because I suppose anyone can understand uh, the repetitive stress of the, on the urinary nerve by using the phone. Uh, lastly, it can be important to cite another common compression site uh, or for the nerve at the so-called arcade of Strathers. It is an aporteronic band that connects the medial intermuscular septum uh, to the medial head of the steel triceps. Um, the clinical significance of this structure is due to the medial nerve and brachial artery, which may pass underneath the arc formed by the process ligament over the humeral body. This ligament can, may also affect the ulnar nerve after an anterior transposition surgery, just to release the uh, ulnar nerve by cubital tunnel syndrome. It's usually unlikely that the ulnar nerves the, are just like affected under the uh, Struthers ligament in patients without transposition surgeries. Well, I hope I uh, could give a, a nice picture of the anatomy and I leave place to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Dear Crescenzo, thank you very much for this excellent introduction. So uh, I think one, uh, one thing that you made very clear is that just by clinical assessment, you can clearly rule out other, or not clearly, but to a very far degree, you can rule out other pathologies, at least in terms of compression, because I think one of the main uh, differentiation between central or spinal or proximal compression and ulnar nerve is that the ulnar nerve really sensory-wise innervates only the hand, but not the ulnar forearm. So this is what you clearly pointed out and all the muscles involved uh, leads to a proper uh, assessment, clinical assessment. And um, so I think you laid a very, very good basis for the, for the next uh, uh, presentations. So uh, I would suggest we move on with the diagnostics to have what you presented in diagnostic imaging. And uh, therefore, I would like to uh, ask Kizarana to give his presentation, and then we will have the discussion. Kaiser, you are on mute. Okay. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deborah, for inviting me to this uh, great discussion. Um, I will give, try and give you guys a little bit of an overview in terms of the role of ultrasound in ulnar neuropathy. Um, we'll be discussing some general uh, diagnostic uh, image, imaging appearances, as well as a little bit more focus on the role of imaging when it comes to dynamic scanning. Right, so um, as my colleague just mentioned uh, in the first presentation, ulnar nerve entrapment is most common at the cubital tunnel. Is there, we cannot see your slides in case. Uh, oh. uh, you try again. Let me try again. Can you guys see it? Yes, it's uploading. Yes, if you just uh, put on the full mode, because we still see the, the preview. Let me try again. Mm -hmm. How about now? Can you guys it's see? Perfect. It? Yes, it's perfect. Um, okay, well, it's working fine now. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, right. So, as I was saying, uh, ulnar nerve, uh, the most common site of entrapment is at the cubital tunnel. The um, there can be various causes for this. The um, most common cause, uh, most common site of entrapment is the cubital tunnel. And the, the reason for that could either be extrinsic causes or it could be mechanical um, movement of the nerve at the cubital tunnel. In terms of extrinsic causes, it could be post-traumatic. For example, after um, a fracture um, of the ulna, um, you might have some osteophytes sticking around from the site or some metal work, which might be impinging on the nerve as it moves around. Uh, you might get uh, periarticular ganglion cysts or soft tissue lesions, which can cause compression at the um, cubital tunnel. Um, so when we scan the ulnar nerve in, in, in our practice, uh, the ulnar nerve is scanned all the way down from the cubital tunnel to down to the Guyon's canal. Um, and it's fairly easy to identify it with ultrasound. And I will show you guys some images to help out in terms of what the normal appearance is. Um, we will be focusing a little bit more on the hypermobility, uh, but it's important to note that hypermobility can be a normal finding in uh, asymptomatic individuals. So as one of our favorite phrases as a radiologist is please, please correlate clinically. So um, all of our findings, um, they needs to be correlated with clinical findings in terms of if the patient is actually symptomatic uh, and whether the hypermobility is indeed the cause of the uh, patient's symptoms. Um, also to note is that some movement and flattening of the nerve can be seen in, again, in normal individuals on elbow flexion, and we'll come to that shortly. Right, so first thing, the equipment. Uh, you do need to have a decent uh, ultrasound machine, which, will, which comes with uh, both of these probes, which I've put in the picture. So you need to have high frequency linear probes um, I prefer the, um, the long linear probe which, uh, the, the, with the wider bevel uh, purely because uh, it, when the nerve is, if it's moving around and flicking around, it's easier to actually catch it in the image. The smaller one is useful in you know, petite, thin individuals um, where uh, the wide, um, uh, wide based scanner, um, the probe cannot actually fit on, onto the patient's elbow. Um, patient positioning, there are different ways. There's no right or wrong way. And the, I tend to prefer put the patient across onto a table or a bed. And the reason for that being, 
It provides adequate supports under the elbow uh, so the patient's elbow doesn't move around too much because you do need to um, have that sort of stability. It does help when the patient, when we're doing dynamic scanning. You can, the other way you can do it is have the patient sit around on the other side of the bed, put a pillow under their elbow. Uh, whatever you find most convenient, um, you can do that, but this is my preferred way of doing it. So we place, uh, starting off, we place the transducer um, near the medial epicondyle. Um, the nerve is assessed for normal appearance, so normal morphology, normal echogenicity. Um, there is slight movement of the nerve on uh, elbow flexion when the patient um, uh, flexes the elbow, the move, nerve moves slightly over towards the medial epicondyle, but it should not dislocate. Um, so a little bit of movement is allowed. Uh, frank dislocation is abnormal. And this So the dynamic scanning is performed like that. The patient, and you can see putting the patient's hand on the bed uh, does help in stabilizing it so the probe stays completely still. So I find this particularly useful. Right, so what does a normal nerve look like? The normal appearance is there's no focal or diffuse thickening of the nerve, um, no movement, no significant movement on dynamic scanning, normal echogenicity. Um, and no compressive lesion, which is which might be uh, uh, causing impingement of the nerve. The subluxation, when we describe the subluxation, basically means that the nerve moves more than what we would expect it to be normally um, um, moving on elbow flexion. So it moves more than what we expect with the normal flexion uh, and perches or partially dislocates, uh, partially subluxes but no, not frankly dislocates. A dislocating nerve will be, it's very easy to catch uh, in terms of uh, very easy to diagnose because you will hear an abrupt palpable clicking or snapping, and you can actually see the nerve dislocate very suddenly over the medial epicondyle. So, uh, so far in, in the last year, just, uh, we have scanned around 158 patients um, from December last year to December um, 2021. Out of those, 81 scans were normal. Um, we found subluxation without frank dislocation in 43, snapping with frank dislocation in 25 patients. Uh, some of uh, those were bilateral. And uh, nine of the, our patients, they showed alternate pathology would explain um, either related directly or indirectly to the ulnar nerve. So a normal appearing ulnar nerve has got its a typical parallel appearance of the fibers. It's mildly echogenic um, on cross-sectional. The nerve is very easy to identify. It's got a honeycomb sort of appearance to it. So what we are assessing for it is that uniform caliber throughout the nerve in longitudinal section, and then no loss of any significant echogenicity um, of the nerve on transverse section. It's important to note that around the cubital tunnel, um, because of the overlying retinaculum and because of the angulation the nerve has to pass through, sometimes you do get a little bit of rounded appearance to the nerve rather than the oval appearance, which I've showed here. Um, that is considered within normal range. Um, so if you do find that and the patient has symptoms, then we can do other tests to confirm our diagnosis. But generally speaking, um, the ulnar nerve, as it passes through the cubital tunnel, it's just good to remember that it can appear a little bit more rounded than the rest of the nerve and does appear slightly more hypoechoic than the rest of the nerves, and that can be within normal limits. Just an example of normal versus abnormal. So what happens when the nerve becomes pathological? Um, the neuropathic nerve loses its normal echogenicity, which you can see very clearly it becomes thickened, you lose that honeycomb pattern and the abnormal one on this side, you can see the uh, nerve fascicles are quite markedly thickened. Um, so these are the signs that we look for. The thickening can be diffuse, it can be localized um, depending on the pathology. Hypermobility wise, so 
The normal nerve will move, move very little around the medial epicondyle. So I'll just point out some things in here. Um, this is the medial epicondyle. Uh, let's see if I can bring up a yeah, pointer. So the medial epicondyle and the nerve sitting right next to it. So you see with elbow flexion, all these images have been taken with elbow flexion. With elbow flexion, there's very little movement of the uh, nerve towards the apex of the medial epicondyle. This nerve is slightly hypermobile and you'll see in this instance, the medial epicondyle lies here. The nerve already looks slightly hypoechoic. So we are suspecting this might be um, already neuropathic and it moves slightly more towards the apex without frankly dislocating over it. And Frank's dislocation, you will see very sudden snapping of the nerve across the medial epicondyle as it crosses over. So in this particular image, the medial epicondyle is down here. This is the nerve after it has dislocated. Before flexion, it lies more posteriorly and then it dislocates anteriorly. This is a case with bilateral and uh, just to show the dislocation is uh, when you do see it, it's quite uh, abrupt and uh, results in a very palpable click and snap. Uh, this particular patient, uh, the ultrasound was very useful because we could not do other, we could not utilize other modalities such as an MRI. Um, this was a post-operative patient. The patient had had previous fracture and some metal work at the, um, in, the, uh, in the bones, which were causing an impingement of the nerve as it crosses over. So just to point out, the nerve lies right at the top here. So there are thickened nerve bundles right at the top. These echogenic lines, they are the, um, some of them uh, are the broken bone fragments and some metal work underneath. And you'll see the nerve slowly catching and chafing over as it crosses over. Um, other pathology which we will identify includes, uh, so this is more localized thickening of the nerve that we see in case of a neuroma. So you, the neuroma generally presents as a fusiform thickening of the nerve. You will have a hypoechoic appearance to the nerves, the loss of, if you remember the normal appearance, you, you lose the normal honeycomb appearance in cross-section and you can see the fusiform appearance on the uh, longitudinal section. Um, more complicated cases can also be picked up with ultrasound and in, in which case, you know, it might not be just only hypermobility, which is causing the problem. There might be other things going on. This again is a post-operative patient, um, who developed a post-operative neuroma as well as an adjacent seroma with scar tissue. All of those were combining to give Allen neuropathy. Uh, sorry. So the image on the right is a still image which shows what the um, little video is showing. So the ulnar nerve, you can see, this is the normal portion of the ulnar nerve. At the abnormal bit, it is very significantly thickened. You've got scarring and soft tissue thickening around it and a persistent post-operative seroma. So all of these around the cubital fossa, which is a very tight area, can lead to ulnar neuropathy. So in summary, ultrasound is an excellent modality for ulnar nerve imaging. Um, one of the main benefits being it's uh, always uh, allows dynamic assessment, which is not possible with other modalities. It's relatively quick and cheap, uh, particularly useful in instances where other modalities cannot be utilized, such as you know when you've got metal work in situ, recent surgery, or for any other reason, the patient can't put the position in the MRI scanner or um, CT scanner. Um, the cons obviously are it's operator dependent, so requires a lot of practice um, and should always be correlated in the clinical picture since, as I mentioned, hypermobility can be seen in asymptomatic patient. So I hope that gives you a brief overview uh, in terms of the importance and role of ultrasound. Um, this is a picture of our hospital. It was taken at night for two reasons, because it looks much nicer at night and obviously it's... Uh, it's too hot in Dubai in the morning. So that's, that's the only time you can take a picture. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Um, I think you showed perfectly 
the advantage of ultrasound compared to MRI. And I think the, one of the most important thing is the dynamic aspect out of it. So moving from anatomy and morphology, we go to function. And I'm very pleased to introduce Giovanni Coco. And he will tell us something about electrophysiology. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I will started to uh, share my presentation and I will try to do it. Okay. And the share screen. Share and I will. Can you see now? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, so uh, so good evening, everybody. And uh, I would like, first of all, to thank Dr. Deborah for uh, asking me to talk uh, at uh, this webinar. I will try to um, provide some information about uh, uh, what can be achieved when uh, a patient is referred with a suspicion of a ulnar neuropathy uh, to a neurophysiologist and also uh, to give uh, some uh, idea about the limitation of uh, uh, this uh, test. So ulnar neuropathy is uh, second only to carpal tunnel syndrome as uh, uh, the reason why a patient uh, is uh, referred for, uh, a uh, for a neurophysiological assessment for an entrapment in the upper limbs. So um, when a, a neurologist uh, approaches a patient with such a clinical suspicion, it needs uh, to confirm or rule out the diagnosis, but also consider uh, other uh, condition which can mimic uh, the symptom of uh, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, such as uh, ulnar neuropathy at the wrist, or for example, a lower uh, uh, cervical radiculopathy or a lower uh, black, uh, brach, uh, brachial plexus uh, uh, lesion. Um, the, also, in some rare cases, uh, you can uh, also find uh, a lesion of a ulnar nerve either in the formal or in the proximal arm. But generally, the two most common sites of compression are either at uh, the elbow or uh, at the wrist. Uh, so you, we know that the ulnar nerve origins from, uh, mainly from C, uh, essentially derives from uh, the C8 and T1 roots. Uh, and uh, eventually, it uh, uh, arrives uh, it origins from the uh, medial um, uh, from uh, uh, the the medial uh, cord of the uh, plexus, uh, and then it runs all through the forearm, uh, sorry, all through the arm, uh, without leaving any branches. So it started to uh, provide the motor branches uh, to uh, the flexor cartilinaris and the flexor digitorio profundus only in the forearm. That's the reason why even with uh, needle electromyography, sometimes we can only give a diagnosis of uh, a axonal lesion of a ulnar nerve um, proximal to the, to the FCU. So generally, we start uh, a, a, a the neurophysiological assessment uh, with uh, the nerve uh, conduction velocity. So localizing uh, the lesion with nerve conduction study uh, is uh, more difficult in patients with ulnar neuropathy compared, for example, to carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, nerve conduction study, especially when there is uh, an axonal loss, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, cannot really localize the site of the lesion. Um, things uh, tend to be easier when there is uh, some delineation, for example, across the elbow. So how do very quickly, nerve conduction study work. So basically, we stimulate uh, a nerve, uh, and then we record uh, the sensory um, action potential or the motor action potential more uh, distally. We have to, in order to calculate the velocity, we need to stimulate uh, uh, only one segment in a sensory nerve, uh, and at least uh, two segments uh, in, uh, um, in, a, in a motor conduction velocity. So in a normal uh, sensory or motor conduction velocity, we can see that, the, uh, the, for example, the, sense, the motor action potential with its amplitude, and, uh, the, and then we stimulate the nerve more proximally. Of course, the latency is going to be increased, and uh, we can then measure 
the distance uh, between the two sides of stimulation and we can calculate the velocity. The machine will calculate automatically the velocity. So, for example, in the upper limbs, uh, normally the velocity is considered normal if it is above uh, 50 meters per second. If we have uh, an axonal lesion, uh, we can see that there is a, a drop in the amplitude. There is also, to some extent, a reduction of the velocity, but not uh, to a major extent. Generally, it's a, the, the cutoff between a demilinating and an axonal uh, neuropathy in terms of reduction of the conduction velocity is considered 70% of uh, 50 meters per second. So, pragmatically, uh, a reduction of the velocity in the upper limbs below 35 meters per second is considered to be demilinating. However, in clinical practice, uh, things are not uh, so clear. There is not uh, such a clear and uh, cut off, and very often you find like a mix of the pictures. So generally, when we approach a patient with uh, the suspicion of the ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, we start with uh, the conduction velocity, um, with the motor conduction velocity, and we record the CMAP from uh, the ADM. So we apply the recording electrode of the ADM. Of course, we need to make sure that there is a, a good grounding. And then we simulate the nerve at the wrist, uh, below the elbow, and above the elbow. And what we try to find is whether there is a reduction of the uh, conduction velocity across the elbow. And of course, we expect that the speed comes back to normal in the forearm when there is a demilinating lesion at, uh, at, uh, at the elbow. Uh, so for example, in this case, we have a patient with uh, a um, ulnar um, neuropathy at the elbow, which is demilinating. Why can we say that? Because uh, the amplitude does not drop significantly, but we can see that the velocity of a segment between the um, uh, between the uh, distal uh, the, the below the elbow and the wrist uh, remains at 60 meter per second, and uh, whilst uh, between uh, the, uh, in, uh, across the elbow there is a reduction of the speed of 40 meter per second. It's important when uh, we uh, measure the uh, distance, the length of the uh, ulnar nerve, that we uh, ask the patient to flex the elbow. Because if we measure uh, the distance between the two points uh, when the elbow is extended, we are going to, um, to uh, underestimate the length of the nerve. And then uh, we are going to find uh, a lower velocity, and this will cause a higher number of uh, uh, false positive uh, uh, for false positive ulna neuropathy at the elbow. Uh, another way to increase the uh, sensitivity of a test is to perform a inching uh, of the ulna nerve. What does it mean? It means that we are going to measure the velocity along the ulnar nerve at the elbow in uh, uh, short uh, um, segments. So generally, we uh, stimulate at least at the four sides uh, below the elbow and at least five, six sides above uh, the elbow. And uh, this is something which can help us to locate the lesion either at the groove or at the uh, cubital tunnel. This is not just a, a simple uh, academic interest, uh, but it can help, for example, the surgeon, if uh, a surgical approach, if a surgical option is considered, uh, to decide, for example, between a simple release uh, versus, for example, a transposition. So how does uh, this test appear? So, for example, we have here the inching from the ulnar nerve in a normal subject. And we can see that uh, the latency between the different segments remains more or less normal. Whilst in this other patient with uh, a ulnar neuropathy at uh, the elbow, uh, we can see that uh, there is a, a sudden increment of uh, 
uh, of the latency between uh, these uh, two segments. We can see that there is a gap between uh, the uh, uh, action potential, which uh, we can elicit with a uh, segmental stimulation. And in this case, uh, the inching has not only confirmed a ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, but it has localized uh, the lesion at the level of uh, uh, the cubital tunnel. So even if this technique can be technically demanding, it can give uh, uh, quite some important piece of information uh, in order to decide how to manage the patient. So as I said, the, we start uh, recording the motor conduction velocities at uh, um, recording from the ADM. But in some patients, uh, uh, especially when the suspicion is very high and perhaps uh, the, um, uh, the uh, motor conduction velocity recorded from the ADM are normal, we can try, for example, to record the velocities from uh, uh, the FDI. Because uh, especially in most of common cases, the FDI is uh, more severely uh, affected. This is thought to be secondary to the um, anatomical organization of uh, the fibers within uh, the ulnar nerve. And uh, the position of the fascicle for the FDI make uh, uh, this muscle more uh, susceptible to uh, a neurodegenic damage in case uh, of uh, a compression of a nerve. So uh, regarding the, um, uh, the sensory velocity, generally they are recorded from, uh, uh, from uh, the fifth finger. So we apply some, elect some recording electrode in the finger and we stimulate uh, uh, the ulnar nerve uh, at uh, the wrist. So typically, in a patient with a demilinating lesion at the elbow, the sensory conduction velocity at the wrist uh, remains uh, normal. And uh, you might wonder, OK, uh, why don't you try to check if the sensory fiber are uh, also affected at the elbow? Because uh, very often, they are uh, uh, technically difficult uh, to perform. Uh, so uh, in, in conversely, we find uh, some uh, uh, axonal um, uh, damage at the level of a sensory fiber, it would be difficult uh, to um, say whether this uh, the lesion is located at the wrist or uh, at, uh, uh, at the elbow. So for this reason, very often is uh, useful to record the, uh, the sensory velocity from the dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve. So uh, the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve origins uh, about five, eight centimeter above the wrist. And uh, it's responsible for supplying uh, sensation in uh, uh, the dorsal medial hand. Uh, so, the, um, so we place uh, the electrode in between the fifth and fourth digit uh, in the dorsal web space. And then we stimulate uh, the nerve eight to 10 centimeter above, uh, above the, the wrist. So in a, in a patient with uh, ulnar neuropathy at the wrist, we expect the dorsal ulnar cutaneous sensory study to be normal, okay? And whilst, uh, uh, so if we find that uh, uh, this, um, this uh, uh, test is abnormal. This is suggestive for a lesion at the level of the elbow. However, the, the opposite is not always true because again, for uh, uh, the uh, organization of a vas uh, the fascicle within the nerve, sometimes the dorsal ulnar cutaneous sensory uh, study could be remain normal in uh, surgically proven cases of ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. So uh, again, to give an example, this is uh, what the sensory conduction velocity in a, a patient with, uh, uh, in a normal patient up here. So here we can see the sensory conduction velocity recording from the fifth finger and here from the dorsal lunar cutaneous nerve, okay? Normal amplitude, normal speed. This is what we expect to find in a patient with uh, uh, a, uh, with uh, a ulnar uh, neuropathy at the elbow in which uh, both the amplitude 
are uh, affected. So in this case, uh, this is suggested for a lesion proximal to the breast. And this is what uh, we typically find in a patient with uh, ulnar neuropathy uh, at the breast. So in this case, the sensory velocity from the fifth finger are abnormal, whilst the dorsal ulcer cutaneous nerve uh, velocity are normal. However, this picture can also be found in uh, clinically proven cases of ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. So if abnormal, definitely suggested for a lesion at the elbow. If normal, a ulnar neuropathy at the elbow could still be the case. So, and then uh, we proceed to, uh, for, uh, for uh, the needle EMG. What is uh, the role of a needle EMG? So number one is to confirm uh, the presence of uh, an uh, axonal lesion. We need to remember that EMG could be completely normal in a mild terminating lesion. It can allow us uh, to help us uh, to localize the lesion because of course, if we find uh, some uh, pathological uh, uh, signs uh, only in uh, the uh, ulnar innervated muscle distally to the wrist, uh, uh, that makes uh, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow unlikely. And also the needle EMG will also help uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we are not uh, overlooking any other condition uh, which uh, is mimicking an ulnar neuropathy, as a, for example, a lower tract uh, plexopathy or a CA trediculopathy. So that's the reason why it's important to sample other muscles which are innervated by C8, for example, typically the APB, and uh, um, making sure that uh, uh, only the ulnar innervated muscles are affected. So the muscles which are generally checked, assessed, are the ADM, the FTP, the, um, the VFDI, the flexor digitorum profondo to digit 4 and 5, and uh, the flexor calpi ulnaris. Uh, so we normally start uh, with uh, the FDI because generally is uh, very well tolerated by, uh, by the patient. Uh, the ADM is uh, less well tolerated, but it needs to be sampled. And especially if uh, they are found to be abnormal, we need uh, to sample another C81 innervated muscle, uh, sorry, another C81 non-ulnar innervated muscle, typically, for example, uh, the APB to make sure that uh, we are not uh, uh, mixing uh, up an ulnar neuropathy with something else. Um, it's, uh, then uh, we move uh, to, uh, for the needle, uh, electromyography of uh, the ulnar innervated muscle proximally, proximal to the, uh, to the breast. So it is important to notice that uh, the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris is either normal or uh, uh, minimally affected uh, in uh, many proven cases of uh, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. When we see that uh, the um, SCU is uh, severely affected, uh, this correlates very well with the level of a compression of a nerve at, uh, at the elbow. So the FTP is generally uh, more sensitive. The reason why this happens, uh, it could be secondary to uh, two explanations. So one is that the fibers for the uh, FCU are located uh, more um, externally on the nerve. And so they are uh, often spared when the nerve is compressed at the elbow. And uh, uh, the other reason why is because the branches for the FCU are more proximally uh, are more origin more proximally to the branches of uh, the FTP. And uh, because of a dying back uh, concept of a nerve lesion, uh, that's the reason why they are more often uh, spared in uh, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, at least in the, in the uh, minor, in the, in, the most, in the mildest case. So what uh, can a patient, what does a neurologist see when uh, he stick a needle in the muscle of a patient? So the first thing that we check uh, is uh, the activity at uh, rest. So for example, this is what we expect in a normal subject. So we insert the needle, we make uh, some more movement within the belly of a needle, we can see some insertional activity. And uh, this is when the operator uh, pull uh, the needle more inside, but otherwise uh, um, the muscle remains uh, silent. Okay, so at rest, uh, uh, 
this line remains flat. And this is what, conversely, can be seen in a patient in which there is some active denervation. So here, the patient is not, uh, um, is not moving his muscle. Uh, the patient is at rest. But we can see some uh, fibrillation. Uh, you can see this uh, sharp action potential. And then we can also see uh, these uh, positive uh, sharp waves. So the presence of this activity at rest is suggestive for active denervation. Then we check the activity of the muscle, asking the patient to activate uh, the muscle. So normally, we could see the motor unit action potential, and they should appear like a very sharp with a, a clear, crisp sound which is uh, described by the neurophysiologist as uh, some popcorn sound. And, uh, uh, and uh, we can also measure, uh, and you can also see that uh, the number of phases is relatively small. This is conversely what uh, uh, happens in uh, uh, a muscle which has been denervated and uh, we, when some uh, renervation has occurred. So you can see the difference. So here we, you can see that the motor unit, uh, motor unit, uh, that the motor unit potential appears to be larger. Uh, the sound is also different, and you can see that there is also a, a higher number of phases. So, uh, summarizing in uh, focal and uh, entrapment, uh, such as ulnar neuropathy, the nerve conduction study and the EMG are useful for assessing the location the severity and the type of injury, typically if it is an axonal or a demyelinating lesion, we need to understand that there could be some technical limitation and some lesion pattern can sometimes force the neurologist to give a final report of non-localizing ulnar neuropathy. And of course, as for ultrasound, we also need to remember that clinical correlation is always required because for example, when uh, we do some nerve conduction study in patients for some other condition, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome, we can find uh, some incidental slowing, for example, at the elbow. And uh, this is completely incidental because the patient is completely asymptomatic in this regard. And, uh, and I would like to thank you for the attention. So, dear Dr. Coco, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And this uh, you know, very important enhancement of uh, diagnostics. So now we have all the information. We know everything about anatomy and what to do now. So I'm very happy to introduce Lucas, the, well, the father of these webinars, uh, to uh, share his experience and opinions on the what to do now with the surgical management. And after this, we will have a discussion before entering the, the details of the surgical techniques. Lucas, please. Christian, thank you for these kind words. Uh, I'm not so old to be a father. I might, might say I, to consider myself a more than a pioneer. Just the webinars, Just not, not my father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but pioneers, one of the pioneers uh, together with you. And uh, congratulations to uh, Deborah and Shimon for organizing this outstanding webinar. Uh, of course, uh, we are all um, keep on uh, rolling in this our activity within the section for peripheral nerves surgery of ENS. And the uh, importance of this uh, webinar, particularly this one, is in uh, uh, just uh, in uh, terms of um, taking um, care about details for only one nerve. So this is first webinar that we are discussing in details about one nerve. Might be in future that we can continue with these webinars in uh, taking uh, care about uh, details and discussion of uh, each individual other nerves in upper extremity and lower extremity, but we'll see later. But generally speaking, my task for today is a clinical presentation indication for surgery in ulnar nerve entrapment syndrome at the elbow from clinical presentation to surgical management. And this is something which is, um, uh, very important and uh, in timing for uh, surgery is also very important as well as uh, clear indication. 
Uh, I would not, um, uh, let's say, take your time uh, in repeating the anatomy uh, after this outstanding uh, presentations of uh, Crescenzo and uh, uh, other colleagues who gave uh, this uh, correlation between uh, uh, anatomy and uh, neurological, neuroradiological evaluation and electrophysiological evaluation, uh, just go through the possibility idea that uh, there can be a multiple site of the compression of ulnar nerve with the same symptoms, which can be, which should be clearly uh, make a differentiation in these uh, circumstances. And then uh, in order to make a, let's say a clear indication, then um, Epidemiology is also mentioned in uh, Crescenzo presentation. There are many risk factors which uh, are, uh, let's say, included in uh, uh, evolution of this uh, very important entrapment syndrome. This uh, might be, let's say, that residents or neurosurgeons doing this kind of surgery consider this as an easy task to do. But uh, later on, I think believe that uh, everybody will understand that uh, this there is there are no easy tasks and uh, especially in these circumstances all details are very important in uh, terms of uh, <clears throat> anatomy i would just like to uh, uh, stress uh, two in my opinion major uh, impact factor in uh, final outcome uh, of treatment of this patient one is um, of, co of course, um, anatomical planes. And another one is um, careful preservation of sensory branches of ulnar nerve in the, in the elbow region. And the other, uh, other thing, vascularization, which is also very important. This requires mm, careful uh, dissection of the ulnar nerve and uh, to take your time in uh, make a, a clear anatomical plane in terms of um, preparation of the ulnar nerve. So in uh, terms of uh, uh, points when where ulnar nerve is uh, uh, can be compressed in the elbow, we heard from uh, Crescenzo. Now we see one uh, interoperative photo of uh, ulnar nerve in situ in cubital tunnel with preserved all sensitive branches, which are not directly uh, sensitive branches uh, from ulnar nerve, but sensitive branches, sensory, sensory branches from other uh, parallel nerves, which are running parallel to, to with uh, ulnar nerve, which also can have great impact on final outcome, especially in terms of uh, appearing of pain after surgery, which is a uh, most important the negative impact factor in quality of life of this patient after surgery. Uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, clear decompression of the nerve. So my message is do not create a new nerve injuries. Take your time in uh, clear dissection of the of the all nerve elements. And now we are coming to our, uh, let's say, main issue of this presentation, these are symptoms and signs. Most commonly reported are, reported are paresthesia in the fifth and fourth fingers. Sensory loss is the first symptom. And clumsiness of the hand is a symptom which uh, developed in, uh, let's say, future. So physical examination is uh, of outstanding importance. And um, you have uh, to examine sensory function and motor function. So sensory function is usual test is two point discrimination test and uh, weakness, motor weakness uh, should be evaluated from muscles innervated proximal to distally. Paradis of the adductor of the thumb, impossibility of passing of the middle finger over the index finger crossing, decrease in the strength of the interosseous and flexor digital profundus in the fifth finger. So <clears throat> paresthesias uh, are a subjective symptom. Weakness, we can see a doctor of the thumb, interosseal muscles, finger crossing, flexor digitorum of the fifth finger. And the uh, tinal sign, this is classical. I mean, I uh, should not explain tinal sign of, uh, in details, but it can, you, it can be used in, in these circumstances. Wartemer sign is also, uh, let's say, most frequently uh, tested. And from it sign, 
like from normal and for performance positive can be useful for evaluation of this patient. So here you see in the, in the video how it looks like one, um, something from some reason cannot be open the video, but uh, generally speaking, uh, this is uh, one hand with uh, uh, suffering of under nerve entrapment in the, in the elbow. So in uh, classifications of the symptoms, uh, usually most frequently Delon's classification from mild through moderate to severe is used for evaluation of this patient. So mild uh, symptoms are intermittent paresthesia, subjective weakness. Moderate are intermittent paresthesia and measurable weakness, pinch or grip. And severe symptoms are persistent paresthesias, uh, abnormal two-point discrimination test, measurable weakness, atrophy, and finger crossing abnormal. Treatment options from mild to severe, mild conservative tre treatment, moderate surgery, severe surgery. I will just go through all this in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, overviewing all this because you will hear in the next presentation from uh, uh, Deborah and Shimon and uh, Kartika all about this. In some circumstances, conservative treatment can give some, some results, but in a very early phase and uh, with a very short duration of symptoms. Usually, patient education is uh, very uh, important in uh, these uh, uh, circumstances uh, to avoid provocative activities and uh, to include uh, physiotherapy and uh, splints. And uh, sometimes some, somebody can try with local steroid injections and analgetics, but in terms of uh, lasting symptoms of three to more than three months, three to six months, in my opinion, when you have a moderate symptoms, this is ideal time for, for surgery. So surgery, there are local procedures, anterior transposition and endoscopic procedure. You will hear the details about this. I just may put this here in order to have some kind of uh, continuity in uh, presentation. Also details about anterior transposition you will hear from, an, from another presentation. This is an example that there were uh, more than several, but these are at least three randomized control trials showing uh, SD matches results with transposition uh, with fewer complications, uh, simple decompression versus transposition, similar or same results. And this is how it looks like in uh, my department uh, in uh, open carpal tunnel release, uh, cubital tunnel release, simple decompression and anterior transposition. Uh, local procedures or endoscopy. This is something what you will hear also from Kartik, who is an expert in this, uh, in this field. And um, uh, this is just uh, for, uh, for uh, let's say, uh, presentation continuity. Now I will show you one patient. It's a female, uh, 40 years old. She had only symptom numbness and the level of the right wrist and uh, fourth and uh, fifth fingers. Duration of symptoms, nine months. She was treated at other institution and uh, uh, it was performed incomplete decompression in situ. And then uh, evaluated at our clinic 12 months following the first treatment. And the clinical findings um, had evolution from mild to severe. Numbness and pain in the level of the medial part of the left forearm, wrist and fourth and fifth finger, hypotrophy of the hypotenor and interosseal muscles, impaired abduction and adduction of the fingers on the right side. Then, of course, we perform all kinds of uh, uh, neurological, neuroradiological and electrophysiological diagnostic procedure and make a correlation with uh, uh, clinical findings. Uh, this was a clear indication for, for surgery. Then one month after first evaluation in our clinic, we, uh, I operate this patient and I decided to make, um, uh, let's say, uh, extended exploration external analysis, complete the compression in situ with preservation of all branches uh, of the other nerve. Very careful dissection. And then outcome after, after uh, uh, nine months, uh, there was no numbness, no weakness, no pain. And if this video is not working, I will kill my, 
residents who prepared this uh, presentation, but uh, this appears uh, very in a very good uh, functional recovery and quality of life of this patient, and this patient were very satisfied uh, after this surgery. Unfortunately, the video is not working. So uh, what is wrong in the, here? This is um, when you prepare your, uh, let's say, uh, surgical incision. You have to be careful how will you, you will do it. And instead of conclusion, indication for surgery should be a failure of conservative treatment, recurrent symptoms or moderates uh, to see and or evolution to the symptoms from moderate to severe stage, nerve conduction velocity uh, lower than 40 millimeters per second, and uh, better postoperative results with uh, less than six months of evolution of the symptomology can be expected. So timing is important in my opinion to operate it in this patient uh, as soon as possible within three to six months of the duration of uh, symptoms. Posterior elbow trauma with neuro neurological symptoms or signs is a clear indication. And in the case of nerve subluxation, you should use anterior transposition. So our close friend, uh, Eric Zager, favorized this um, strategy in uh, peripheral neurosurgery, which I uh, uh, use uh, also in my department. And um, this is courtesy of him, this idea to promote um, uh, KISS strategy, keep it simple, surgeon, in terms of uh, treatment of this patient, the essence of neurosurgery. So you should cover simply clinical history and exam are the simply, foundation, simply foundations of diagnostic and peripheral neurosurgery. Keep the indications for surgery simple, try conservative measures, make the surgery simple, avoid complications. Nerve surgery can be done with simple basic instruments. And if you have a complication, accept it and deal it with it. So these are some tasks uh, because we are doing uh, uh, our uh, job in promoting uh, the importance of peripheral nerve surgery in, in, uh, within the worldwide, especially through the low and middle income countries. These are some tasks that we are continuously working on and preparing for education of the uh, young uh, neurosurgeons to, uh, let's say, understand and to start dealing with peripheral nerve surgery from starting from organizing live webinars and educational courses. And of course, uh, on-site education operation with local neurosurgeons and uh, all other educational stuff. So keep calm and raise awareness and love brachial plexus surgery. Uh, this year we will have uh, in October 16 to 20, uh, ENS 2020 Congress in Belgrade. I cordially invite all of you to join us. Uh, I hope, I believe that uh, this uh, situation with uh, COVID-19 pandemic will be finished at least at the middle of this year. So we can um, join in uh, Belgrade uh, as in all times in full capacity. And then after that, we have our Serbian Annual Society, uh, Serbian Annual Research Society 8th Annual Meeting uh, in December. Of course, you will all receive this information. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So this is uh, this was my uh, short Thank you, talk. Lucas. Thank you very much. And um, I think um, we have now a lot of very interesting information. And I think too that this was somehow the idea this webinar was born on uh, with Deborah discussing with us the the approach of. Um, of what to do now. So we have everything. We have a patient with problems. We have the conduction studies. We have the imaging. We know maybe that the nerve is somehow luxating or not luxating. So what to do next? And I would like to open the discussion and um, um, ask Deborah to please have some comments on her, uh, well, changing of her treatment concept. So because this is where this webinar started from. Deborah, please. Turn, turn on your microphone, Deborah. Yeah. Deborah, turn on your You're microphone. on mute. Deborah, we can't hear you. 
Well, I mean, everybody that knows me knows that it's very infrequent that I'm new to the right. So anyway, so first of all, Happy New Year again to everybody. And uh, I think we have uh, quite a remarkable um, number of participants. So it seems that this is a, an interesting topic. Now, um, the reason why we decided that we were going to organize this uh, webinar is because we have to admit that this is a very common um, pathology that is frequently encountered uh, in neurosurgical practice, uh, and it's not only uh, managed by neurosurgeons. Uh, um, Dr. Kisa Rana and uh, Dr. Giovanni Cocco um, are working with me. I have the pleasure of having their collaboration and support. And um, I am dealing with a lot of cases of ulnar nerve entrapment, but I'm not the only one. And um, there are orthopedic surgeons, uh, there are end surgeons, there are plastic surgeons uh, that consider that they might also uh, treat these cases. And of course, there are uh, controversies about the way we should do things. So, um, so um, the reason why I wanted to, to do this webinar is, is because especially uh, for young surgeons uh, starting their career, I think it's important uh, to try to focus uh, on which are the, the main um, uh, the main course um, uh, related to this pathology and try to have uh, uh, good guidelines uh, that should help them to try to um, uh, give a good treatment. Now, um, there are a few things which have already been mentioned so far, and um, I think I would like to sum up that. Um, first of all, um, we definitely need to have a, 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 an appropriate diagnostic assessment. And I think nowadays we all agree on the fact that although electrodiagnostic studies still are part of the mainstay of the diagnostic assessment, um, uh, nowadays it's not conceived anymore that you do not apply also imaging uh, and ultrasound has become a must. Um, in the assessment of these patients, uh, uh, because it, it's, uh, it's um, a, a method of study that certainly provides a, a lot of important information. And as I'm trying to um, emphasize uh, when I'm doing my presentation, um, uh, it helps a lot to try to understand uh, uh, the physiology of uh, other nerve neuropathy. Um, something else which has been um, very clearly um, highlighted is um, how important is the assessment uh, with the MG and nerve conduction study, and especially the, the importance of differential diagnosis. And finally, in uh, Luca's presentation, we had um, an overview of the clinical presentation um, of these patients, of the clinical picture, and also some very important guidelines uh, related to when we consider that we should give indication for conservative management and surgical treatment. And Luca already mentioned something that might be related to surgical technique, which is going to be developed um, in the second part of the webinar. So uh, would you go as far as saying, because it's very interesting that uh, Kieser reminded us that without clinics, all the imaging, and uh, Giovanni did too with all the imaging and all the conduction story, studies, if you have no symptoms, uh, nobody will touch a nerve, I guess. Yeah, that's absolutely something that we, I think, uh, all agree on. Um, um, we start considering that we have a clinical presentation that has to be suggestive of an, an ulnar nerve entrapment. And, uh, and then if the, the, the diagnostic workup is basically um, something that we advocate in order to confirm the clinical suspicion, um, but I think this is a, a well-known concept for all of us. You do not give indication for surgery, whereas you don't have a clinical presentation which is consistent with the findings uh, on, the, on the investigations, um, letting alone their electrodiagnostic or, um, um, or imaging. I mean, uh, an example that I might give is that we, we know very well that sometimes when you have a patient studied uh, with the MG and conduction study, there might be findings which might be suggestive of a carpal tunnel syndrome, but yet the patient does not have a clinical picture related to that. And we all know that these are not cases that should be given indication for surgery. This is uh, something which is um, uh, very important to understand from for all uh, young neurosurgeons that um, 
symptomatology of um, ulnar nerve entrapment in the elbow can look like it's, uh, I mean, uh, easy to understand, easy to uh, manage, easy to recognize, uh, but, and easy to make, uh, let's say, um, connection with uh, clinical symptoms and fine, but you should, uh, don't forget that there are possibility for double crush, even triple crush uh, lesions with our, uh, on ulnar nerve with the same symptoms or very similar symptoms. And this can, uh, let's say, mislead uh, surgical uh, indication to operate on, a, let's say, wrong level. For example, this is especially when you have uh, symptoms which is, uh, let's say, not clear if they are from elbow or from Guillaume canal. And that's why, uh, that's why EMG, EMG, evaluation is very important. And when you have an experienced uh, EMG uh, evaluator, you have to keep it with you very close in order to have a correlation with the clinical findings and EMG findings. Also, ultrasound is very, very useful for this situation. And of course, uh, I believe that uh, Deborah and Shimon and Kartrick will discuss this in uh, your, their presentation. What about when you have a, a double side compression? When you really, let's say, establish uh, that you have a compression on the two levels and that this kind of compression can be treated surgically. Should you treat, treat it surgically at the same time or in a two stages procedure and uh, operated in the cubital tunnel and beginning tunnel in uh, terms of um, uh, clear decompression, etc. But let's uh, leave this discussion for the second part of the of the uh, our webinar. So I think one is that we are all interdependent on each other. So the uh, neurologist, the radiologist, can only you know work with the information we give, and vice versa. So it's anywhere it's uh, operator dependent. So of course there are uh, in like in all fields, the neurologists who maybe have difficulties to find uh, a nerve once it's, for example, transposed or to, to, to rule out the proper muscles to examine and so on. So this is uh, the same way as surgeons might have an incision somewhere which who are not experienced, which is you know, not appropriate for decompression of the ulnar nerve. So we need to learn from each other. And I think the, the, the most important factor is to work together to have the best assessment possible, even if it's let's say just a cubital tunnel, which is not, um, well, the most complex uh, neuropathy we have, but if it's not assessed in a proper way by all uh, people involved, uh, we can do harm to patients. That was Lucas was mentioning. So you need to be careful and meticulous all the time, no matter if it's a plexus or, or an ulnar nerve. So what's the opinion of the, of Giovanni and Kizer about this. Uh, you mentioned a very good point here. Uh, sorry, what you have to want um, Basically, um, my uh, assessment and the interpretation of, of the findings uh, are very much, um, you know, I have to address the question uh, that the neurologist or the surgeon has put in front of me. So if I get the best information, I can give the best report out to it. If it's just if the clinical indication just says pain, then my report is going to be very generic. But um, if I'm provided with the right information that the pain, and this is the likely point uh, of uh, compression or pathology, then I'm able to formulate a very good report, um, which will be useful, much more useful to the clinician than a general generic report. Um, so absolutely, you know, I mean, um, learning from each other and you know this is quite enlightening all this session because now i find out what you guys actually do when you uh, poke pins into patients for uh, nerve conduction studies and what the actual surgeries looks like dr deborah keeps sending me some gruesome pictures once in a while of the surgery she performs um but yeah it's, it's good to correlate what i see on on ultrasound to um, what you guys do uh, to the patients later just one question. Can you just tell the audience how you measure your swelling? Because not each swelling is of any pathologic findings, you know. 
just tell us something about the cross-sectional area and how you measure it and so um whenever i find if uh, so generally speaking at the cubital tunnel as i mentioned they the nerve does appear slightly unusual as compared to the rest of the nerve um, in terms of the cross-sectional areas there are you know there are various papers which which have been published which uh, give different measurements but for me the more important thing is if there is any asymmetry if the swelling is focal or diffuse if it is actually the there is f changes which would um, suggest that this is actually pathological rather than just um, um, the appearances of the nerve at that particular site. So I don't routinely measure cross-sectional area for ulnar nerve. For median nerves, we do. Um, but uh, we do, uh, the measurement I, do, I take into account is the AP diameter um, uh, or AP cross-sectional thickness of the nerve. And if I can make uh, another comment is uh, whilst uh, Dr. Rana uh, is uh, asking for uh, more uh, information in order to you know, prior to performing the ultrasound, uh, I would suggest to the neurosurgeon to be more demanding uh, to, uh, vers towards the neurologist when they issue the report in the sense that uh, you should not be happy about just uh, a diagnosis of ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. You should, uh, make sure that uh, there is a, a standardized way of uh, reporting, uh, for example, the degree of severity of uh, the uh, compression or the lesion, for example, at the ulnar, uh, at, the, at the elbow, the ulnar nerve. For example, um, in, there are different uh, uh, scales. Eh? So you would expect that the neurology will tell you or the neurophysiology will tell you it's a mild, moderate or severe for the time constraint. I couldn't, uh, I wouldn't love to, to talk uh, more at length about this topic. But for example, if uh, there is a pure demilinated lesion at uh, the elbow, that is uh, suggestive for a mild uh, neuropathy. When you start to see uh, some abnormality in the sensory velocities, uh, or you start to see sign of denervation, or you start to see abnormal motor unit action potential, that is uh, more suggestive for, uh, uh, for a more severe uh, lesion. And then so that could uh, eventually decide to change, or for example, the presence of active denervation, that uh, some uh, neurophysiological finding can uh, shift, uh, for example, the uh, choice of, uh, for uh, a conservative as opposed to a surgical management. Something like uh, it happens, for example, in carpal tunnel syndrome, which have a uh, grade, uh, you know, I use a scale, the Canterbury carpal tunnel syndrome scale, which ranges from one to six. So if it is mild, moderate, or severe, so if it is mild, you can say to the patient, we can try with conservative treatment. If it is severe, you say, well, it's better, especially if you see that uh, symptoms are progressing very quickly. It's, uh, uh, better to think sooner than later about the surgical approach. So in, in routine practice, what I then generally tend to do with the ulnar nerve is uh, I'll take uh, the AP diameter or AP um, uh, size of the nerve before the cubital tunnel, at the level of cubital tunnel, and just after it. So, um, you know, if, there, if it shows features that would be compatible with neuropathy, then we can do further measurements as requested. Um, or I would quote those measurements uh, specifically and also tend to compare it with the other side. Because as I say, sometimes it might just be, it's normal for the patient. But if it's fairly obvious in terms of sudden increase um, in the um, diameter before or after the cubital tunnel, generally with uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, if the nerve is being compressed, just post the cubital tunnel, you will get the swelling of the nerve immediately after it. Um, or similarly, you know, if there is marked flattening, then I will uh, give the measurements at the level of the cubital tunnel and before and after it for, you know, uh, helping in um, getting to the diagnosis. Okay, so I guess we are ready to dive into surgery. Uh, we also, we already had some, well, some teasers. And I would like to ask Shimon to kiss us, as Lucas would put it, and um, um, tell us about the simple in situ decompression. Shimon from Tel Aviv, please share your experience with us. Yes, thank you. Nice stuff here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. 
have so many lectures. Okay, it's uh, it's okay. You see him? We see all the slices, but not in the presentation mode, Simon. Just Simon, put on a slideshow. It's okay now. Again, a slideshow because we still see the the next slides. I see. Perfect. Now, now. Thank you very much. Sorry. It's uh, good evening for everyone. A happy New Year's and especially healthy and successful years for everyone. The issue of this presentation is the uh, open in situ release uh, techniques and discussion regarding uh, uh, advantages and maybe disadvantages of these techniques, and especially uh, meta analysis in compared with anterior transposition. Ulnar air compression as the elbow, as capital, capital syndrome, is the second most common compression in neuropathy of the upper lip. It's 25 cases per 100,000 persons, and average age is 51 years, 65 of them is male. The grow is the site of maximal nerve compression in most cases. During extension, the distance between two bony points is a close. Elbow flexions increases the strength and compression of the ulnar nerve. Surgical treatment of ulnar nerve entrapment as the elbow remains controversial. <laughs> Operative treatment options include simple decompression and anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve. The debate about operative treatments is dogmatic, with trials claiming excellent results for each of the treatment options. The objective of this presentation is evaluation of the effectiveness of open in situ approach for neurovascular decompression in the treatment of capital tunnel syndrome. Operative technique is really simple. The decision that the compression is performed through the five to six centimeters, that's all, incision in the projection of the ulnar nerve. It's, and the, after open of the skin, the deep fascia also is divided and fascia a facial route between medial epicondyl and olecrana is divided in the proximal to distal direction. The most important point from my, uh, I think in this, in this uh, uh, approach is not only to open a nerve, it must be very careful, why? Not only to the uh, injured nerve, especially to preserve two small branches, flexor carpi ulnaris, and also branch to elbow joint. Because in cases of transection of these small branches, after surgery, also after successful so-called surgery, patient will be continue to suffer from intractable pain, imitated ulnar nerve entrapment. And part of the revision is the, in patient after in situ release will be found normal or intact nerve, but the painful neuroma in the place of these small branches. During the surgery, of course, it's, it's better to do this with high magnification or loop or microscope, and there is dissected. It's not dissected circumferentially or mobilized out in this bed. Why? Because this minimizes trauma of the nerve and preserves its nutrient blood supply. But part of the supply, vascular supply, is from the bed of the nerve. For this reason, it's very important to preserve nerve in the same, in same position. It's not only to open in area in the elbow. Also, time to time, possible additional places of, um, the, of entrapment. It's, it's, more, it's happened not rarely, that entrapment between a two a branch, two, a, two a, a, a muscle is flexor carpi ulnaris muscle ulnar head and also flexor carpi ulnaris ulnar head in this place. And also very important during the surgery, to release or decompress nerve in this area if necessary, and also to continue proximally to see this nerve is completely free. 
this is intraoperative electrophysiological monitoring in situ release. In part of the cases, we found increase in during the surgery a, a, a action potential of the nerve after a microsurgical release of the nerve. In compare, in part of the cases with the anterior transposition, we found decrease of the compound muscle potential after release of the nerve. Uh, techniques is simple and delicate, but more important because it's controversial question, what is the better approach, in situ release or anterior transposition? I investigate literature regarding a, a meta-analysis of a meta-analysis randomized control trials is compare in situ release versus, versus uh, anterior transposition in cases of idiopathic cubital tunnel syndrome. First meta-analysis was is that the found was published in 2007, was analyzed totally 361 patients. We compared simple decompression with anterior ulnar transposition. The results of this meta-analysis, no difference in motor nerve conduction velocity or clinical out uh, outcome between simple decompression and ulnar nerve transposition in patients with no prior traumatic injuries or surgical procedure involving the affected elbow. Another study, this was a very famous study from 2008. So it was investigated 490 cases for simple decompression in similar cases for anterior transposition, and also found no statistically significant difference in surgical approaches between both studies. But there was found a trend forward to improve clinical outcome with transposition of the ulnar nerve as opposed to the simple decompression. And last study, huge study, was published in 2019, was analyzed 2,154 procedure from 70 studies, and the uh, uh, simple transposition, simple decompression versus the uh, ulnar nerve transposition. Few results of this study. First of all, meta analysis of clinical improvement. In meta analysis of clinical improvement, no statistically significant difference in clinical outcome between both methods. Another meta analysis of this study is a, a cases of revision surgery. In cases of revision surgery, also no statistically significant di difference in rate of revision surgery. Surprisingly, was results of a complication, meta-analysis of complication in both of, of, both of these methods show statistically significant difference in complication. And most of him, this complication is sensitive scar. Is, this is simple decompression. The, this is anterior uh, transposition. 36 compared in four. Infection, 11 in, in transposition, 25 infection. In CRPS, CRPS is uh, only two cases in simple decompression and 11 cases in the anterior transposition. Together is approximately three times more complication in the anterior transposition in compared with simple decompression. In conclusion, the open approach provides a convenient view of the ulnar nerve. One, second, minimize the risk of nerve or vascular damage during the release. Third, allows extensive removal of adhesion, scar tissue and fibrous bandages followed by the vascular decompression. Simple decompression of the ulnar nerve at the elbow is a straightforward procedure for relief of parasthesias and motor symptoms caused by entrampled neuropathy of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. It has the advantages, at least morbidity, shortest recovery, and maintenance of the nerve in its anatomical location, keeping its vascular supply in. Thank you very much for your attention. Simon, thanks a lot for this overview, especially for the studies. And I think we should merge directly into the next presentation of Deborah. I think I don't need to introduce you. Thanks again for organizing this webinar, Deborah, and we are looking very forward for your next talk.
Um, so I think I'm sharing my screen. Um, do you see it? Not yet. Um, so. Sorry, I have a problem because, yeah, I need to send me the update adesso. Okay, share. Yeah. And it goes by right. Mm -hmm. Io l'ho provato poco fa, andava perfettamente. Ah, ok, look, okay. Okay, so can grazie. So can you see now? Yeah. Yes, it's perfect. Thank okay. Uh, so um, sorry for uh, the inconvenience of keeping you waiting. Okay, so uh, Shimon has already started to talk about surgical technique and he focused on simple in situ decompression. And my talk is going to be about anterior subcutaneous transposition. Now, um, before we go on, um, I would like to remind you, and this is something that was already mentioned by Lucas in his presentation, that when it comes to surgical treatment of ulnar nerve entrapment, we actually um, have two groups uh, of different surgical techniques. Uh, the compressive techniques, which encompasses the simple in situ decompression that might be done with open surgery and endoscopic release, and medial epicondylectomy, that it belongs to the past because it has already been abandoned because it was related to a very high rate of complications. And then we have to so the so-called transposition techniques. We have three different transposition techniques, um, uh, the anterior subcutaneous transposition, which is going to be the topic of this presentation, subfascial or intramuscular transposition, um, which is also related uh, with um, a, um, a quite high rate of complications uh, and Lermont technique that is actually selected just uh, um, in, um, in very uh, few cases. Now, um, Shimon already emphasized that simple in situ decompression is considered by many like the first choice technique because it's a feasible approach, it's a simple technique, it provides uh, an easy postoperative um, um, recovery, and also uh, the outcome is considered ex extremely satisfying. But um, my question, and my question to you um, is, uh, are we sure that simple in situ decompression is always the right choice? Because as we know, um, one of the main factors that affect uh, surgical outcome is actually related to correct indication for surgery and the kind of strategy that you apply. So um, in trying to advocate um, uh, which technique might be the best one um, uh, when we compare simple in situ decompression versus anterior subcutaneous transposition, I'm going to talk again about something which has already been mentioned before, which are the physiological changes occurring during elbow flexion. Now, whenever we, we flex the elbow, we observe that there is a reduction in the height of the cubital tunnel, there is an increase in the endoneural pressure, there is a stretching and elongation of the nerve, and, and this is the factor that from our point of view is the most important one, we observe there is a medial displacement that is usually estimated as seven millimeters, but in some cases, as um, Dr. Rana um, already explained, might be more relevant and may um, um, be related to what we call hypermobility of the ulnar nerve. Now, um, based on the data in the literature, hypermobility of the ulnar nerve is found in a percentage um, um, ranging from 16 to 37% based on the different studies um, in the general population. Um, it might be also associated to a snapping triceps, and um, it's usually considered uh, uh, an asymptomatic condition. 
Um, yet we have to consider that um, there might be situations uh, where um, hypermobility of the alar nerve is actually related to the onset of symptoms that might uh, be related to a clinical picture of um, uh, alar neuropathy. And I would like to know that nowadays, um, um, although in the past um, uh, it seems that the, this was not uh, an influent factor, um, nowadays and probably also related to, the, um, to a more complete uh, diagnostic assessment as we do nowadays with the integration of uh, electrodiagnostic studies uh, and also um, imaging, uh, we start to see that there might be a correlation between uh, ulnar nerve entrapment and hypermobility of the ulnar nerve. Um, so um, hypermobility might be a factor predisposing to the development of ulnar nerve neuropathy, but also there might be also evidence that there is a more severe clinical presentation. Something that we also have to emphasize as surgeons is that it seems that an hypermobility of the ulnar nerve may be something that you find spontaneously in the general population, but it's also something that can be hydrogenically triggered by simple in situ decompression. So um, focusing on what was the question that we initially uh, asked, is simple in situ decompression always the right choice. And in particular, do we still consider simple in situ decompression the first choice technique if we have a patient with hypermobility of the ulnar nerve? Um, and um, um, in the literature, there is um, uh, some mention that actually, um, when you have a iatrogenically induced hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, you have the possibility that the simple decompression is uh, doomed to fail. And um, uh, some others consider that early transposition may actually prevent um, um, this kind of complication and therefore decrease the rate of, of revision surgery. Now, um, in order to um, talk about um, um, these uh, issues, uh, I, am, I have reviewed my surgical series um, uh, for the last year of practice here in UAE since I joined MediClinic um, uh, Parkview Hospital. And, and therefore I started to collaborate with uh, Giovanni and, uh, and Kieser. And I have reviewed the patients um, uh, between December 2020 and December 2021. And personally, I have assessed about 53 patients, a prevalence of male patients, and most of them were in the age group of the third and the fourth decades that presented symptoms that might be considered clinically suggestive of an ulnar neuropathy. Uh, all my patients were studied with electrodiagnostic tests and then also with a dynamic ultrasound of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. And I always ask a bilateral study because I, I always want to compare both sides. Um, occasionally, in some specific situations, we also completed the diagnostic assessment with an MRI. Now, uh, diagnostic workup eventually confirmed a clinical um, uh, diagnosis of ulnar nerve entrapment in 39 patients out of, 40, of 53. Um, something which I would like to emphasize is that these patients presented uh, um, uh, quite similar characteristics. Uh, um, due to work or to um, their leisure time, they all had to um, spend a lot of time using electronic devices like, for instance, smartphones. Um, they had to do a lot of office work and therefore spending uh, um, long hours typing. And especially with the, with the lockdown, um, uh, this is a situation that apparently got worse. <laughs> And um, uh, a peculiar feature probably of my surgery, of my series is that uh, quite a high percentage of my patients were recreational weightlifters. And uh, specifically 70% of, uh, of them practice uh, weightlifting and uh, uh, lifting as an average between 50 up to 120 kilograms. Um, of the 39 patients that I mentioned were diagnosed with uh, ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, seven of them are act had already been submitted to surgery. Six patients uh, were submitted to simple in situ decompression, and they had in uh, three cases a temporary resolution of their symptoms. In one case, there was no change at all, and in two cases, there was actually a worsening of the symptoms, 
one patient um, had been submitted to an intramuscular transposition, and after the, the first surgery, he started to complain about excruciating pain, and he also presented a progressive impairment um, uh, with motor and sensory deficits. Now, um, talking about the overall uh, pool of patients, um, it's interesting to note that the percentage of patients uh, that presented hypermobility of the ulnar nerve in this series uh, is 70%. Therefore, remarkable higher of the percentage uh, up to 37, which has been reported to occur in the general population. So if we compare this data, we would say that it seems that hypermobility of the ulnar nerve uh, seems to be a major factor in predisposing to the onset of uh, ulnar neuropathy. So um, following more or less the guidelines that Lucas already mentioned before, um, we designed uh, what kind of treatment we are going to indicate for these patients. Uh, 25 uh, were given indication for conservative management and 14 patients uh, underwent surgery. And it's interesting to note that out of the 14 patients that were uh, given indication for surgery, 10 of them presented an associated hypermobility of the ulnar nerve. And specifically, um, eight primary cases presented hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, uh, whereas uh, two of the cases of revision surgery uh, had developed uh, and uh, uh, presented an hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, which I do not know whether it was a uh, a pre-existing condition before the first surgery because these patients were operated without a pre-op ultrasound. So um, I would say that these are cases um, uh, if, that if you have a, a, a tendency um, to subluxation or if you have a frank dislocation, so if you have an hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, Simple in situ decompression is probably not your best uh, um, technical choice, uh, and you should go uh, for an anterior subcutaneous transposition. And this is a concept that also Lucas emphasized uh, um, at the end uh, of his presentation. So I am um, briefly mentioned here, which are the main steps to perform a correct anterior subcutaneous transposition. Of course, we have to perform a decompression of the ulnar nerve uh, along its course. Uh, uh, taking care of um, uh, uh, decompressing the nerve uh, um, in the cubital tunnel, but also in between the two heads of the flexor carpionaris. It's essential to carefully prepare the branches um, uh, for the flexor carpionaris. Um, a major step is always uh, to take care of resecting the intermuscular septum, uh, because in cases of anterior subcutaneous transposition that failed, very often on revision surgery, it was documented that the intermuscular septum had not been resected, and this eventually created a secondary kinking of the nerve. And then you can mobilize the nerve, which is going to be, as we are going to see, uh, fixing the new uh, uh, domicile. Um, and some others uh, also recommend uh, an excision of the offending snapping medial portion of the triceps uh, in case of an association of snapping triceps. Now, um, these are surgical videos uh, that show the presence uh, of uh, a snapping ulnar nerve that you can see um, before the Osborne uh, aponeurosis uh, was resected. And uh, uh, this clearly shows uh, uh, how um, after um, uh, opening uh, the, the cubital tunnel, uh, the, the frank dislocation becomes even more evident. This is a situation that um, if it is not further treated with an anterior subcutaneous transposition, is certainly not going to sort out the, the symptoms of the patient. Now, um, the interesting thing is that um, out of the 14 cases I mentioned before, one of my patients um, um, also presented a, a complete lack of Osborne's aponeurosis. Um, this is um, uh, a finding that I already have found in a couple of, of cases um, um, in, uh, in patients I operated in the past years uh, in, the, um, yeah, in the UAE. 
Um, it's very important uh, and um, to pay attention to the cutaneous branches that you find because um, um, otherwise, as uh, Shimon correctly mentioned, uh, um, damaging these cutaneous branches may expose to the development of a, of a neuroma that can uh, partially compromise the, the valid the functional outcome of your surgery. And uh, um, it's always uh, uh, very important uh, to identify, isolate, and uh, carefully mobilize uh, uh, the branches for the flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, um, this surgery should always be performed under magnification. Uh, there is also something I, I would like to um, mention. Uh, usually it is believed that uh, the ulnar nerve is starting to branch off uh, at the level of the flexor carpi ulnaris, but I think it's an experience of all of us that occasionally there might be also some branching for the triceps um, uh, above the level of the, of the, of the elbow. Um, so um, the, the nerve is then um, uh, transposed. As I said, uh, we also have to pay attention to um, resect the intermuscular septum to prevent the third uh, um, kinking of the nerve at this side. And then um, in order to prevent that there is um, a slipping um, of the ulnar nerve back into the, the, the empty groove, uh, we prepare um, a sling of um, uh, fat tissue, which is going to uh, maintain uh, the nerve in the new domicile. And this is the, the final picture. Um, in case of uh, a snapping triceps, uh, which is a situation that I, I happen to find in very few cases and, and not in the, in the small group of patients that I have reviewed for this webinar, um, it is suggested that you should also perform a lateral transposition or excision of the offending snapping medial portion of the, of the triceps. And um, uh, Robert Spinners, for instance, uh, specifically highlights uh, that this might be actually um, a situation that favors the failure of, of your outcome uh, if you do not uh, also um, apply this, um, this step. So uh, talking uh, uh, about the outcome of, of uh, my patients, I have to say that first of all, um, the patients I examined in these cases were just um, operated um, in this last year. So of course, follow-up is not um, probably long enough, but so far all patients uh, presented a satisfactory outcome. Um, the, um, the conclusion is that um, we really have to consider that uh, hypermobility of the ulnar nerve may be a major factor that predisposes to ulnar nerve entrapment. And there is something that I would like to emphasize. Um, it might be that nowadays we, we have a, a lifestyle change that might actually make uh, hypermobility of the ulnar nerve to be more important than it was in the past. Um, Lucas mentioned that usually um, this entrapment syndrome is mostly found uh, in the fifth decade. But for instance, as I showed you, my patients were all in the in the third and the fourth decade, so um, uh, significantly younger uh, than what mentioned in the in the literature so far. We also have to consider, as Crescenzo mentioned at the beginning uh, in the first presentation, that it seems that the use of electronic devices like smartphones. Uh, uh, seems to have been correlated uh, uh, with um, an higher incidence of this pathology. And this is definitely confirmed in, in my uh, experience. Um, there is evidence in the literature that probably hypermobility might also be related to more several clinical present, to more severe clin clinical presentation. Um, we definitely need to know whether this condition is present and therefore dynamic ultrasound of the ulnar nerve should always be included in your diagnostic assessment. If you found out that a patient presents an hypermobility of the ulnar nerve, I would recommend that you do not consider simple in situ decompression as first choice. And uh, personally, I believe that even in those cases that hypermobility of the ulnar nerve has not been preoperatively documented, you might consider that um, choosing anterior subcutaneous transposition versus simple in situ decompression may be um, something that prevents uh, um, the, uh, the onset of a uh, iatrogenic hypermobility and therefore you might prevent the recurrence of symptoms and the possibility for a revision surgery. Um, I do hope my presentation was clear enough and I thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Deborah.
for this clear statement and presentation. I think we should move forward for the last speaker, but just I would like to encourage again the audience, please write down in the chat your questions so that we later on can discuss everything. So right now I'm able and very happy to introduce Karthik Krishnan. I think we will see right now very, very nice and small incision. So Karthik, I'm looking very forward. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody, everybody can hear me. I just want a feedback that you can hear me. Just give me a We can shout. perfectly hear and see you, Kartik. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So um, I was given the task of uh, talking about the ulna nerve entrapment of the elbow, the role of endoscopy. Uh, this wonderful seminar, much has been already said. So I'm not going to go into the details of the diagnostics and the epidemiology and so on. I'll just focus just on the endoscopic part of the, of the, of the deal. So there are, when it comes to endoscopy, there are two techniques that are used for nerves. The, the first technique is the so-called bougie technique. Bougie means to dilate. You use a bougie to dilate a space and introduce the endoscope into the space which you have dilated and perform a release and the salient features of the bougie technique are dilate the nerve canal, introduce the endoscope into the canal and perform a release with an inline view. That means you don't view the nerve itself, but the structures which you're gonna be decompressing. The retractor technique is you dilate the space around the nerve canal or uh, for that matter, anything, and uh, introduce the endoscope into this tent which you have created of the soft tissue and perform the release. The, uh, we, you have a bird's eye view of the structure you're going to manipulate. And um, yeah, you cannot, uh, you, you need supple tissues. You need the tissue that is elastic and nice and, and allows itself to be raised like a tent. You cannot, uh, you cannot operate Iron Man with that, sorry. So this is a schematic representation of the bougie principle where you introduce, you can see a facial band, so let me try to. Um, well, there, over there, this is the canal where the nerve uh, is encompassed in the facial band and you introduce uh, the endoscope into this canal and uh, use a knife or any other device to cut the facial band which uh, happens to be on top of the endoscope whereas you see the endoscope itself views, uh, views the band, use the ligaments but not the nerve itself. You see, as opposed to that, um, the oh, I got the uh, I got the wrong picture. I'm sorry. So, as opposed to that, the endoscopic uh, the the retractor view is um, you introduce the retractor endoscope on top, and you have a bird's eye view. You will. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a wrong picture but you will get to see the technique in the by and by. The salient differences between the two are in the bougie technique, you dilate a cram space. In the retractor technique, you do not dilate the nerve canal itself. Bougie technique is limited to decompression only. Retractor technique, you can use it, use any other surgical instrument. You can use it for transposition and harvest. In the bougie technique, you use a knife, only a knife. And uh, the bougie technique is limited to certain anatomical sites, whereas the retractor technique is quite universal and is not limited to anatomical sites. So the bougie technique is basically limited to nerves only, whereas the retractor technique is not limited to nerves. So this is the bougie endoscope where you can see, this is like a pistol where you enter the uh, nerve canal with the pistol and cut uh, whatever is lying on top of it. So the nerve itself is not visualized. This is, a, this is an example video 
of the buji endoscopy technique. You make the incision, the carpal tunnel, and you introduce. Um, so far, so far, it is all done. That that is a blind manipulation where you manipulate with just the feeling, and then you introduce different kinds of bougies to dilate, and then you introduce the gun, the, the bougie uh, endoscope, the AG endoscope, and but you see the, the um, nerve itself is located somewhere below the endoscope itself and not visualized. I'm sorry, I had to repeat that. I wanted to show with a pointer, but somehow it's got repeated. So there, it is being introduced and it is being, so the nerve is, if you see the top left corner, uh, the nerve is located below and um, the endoscope is able to visualize only the ligaments and at a very, very close, close up. And there uh, you can nicely see the, fat tissue, the, the ligament has been cut, cut completely and the fat tissue comes in um, and bulges into the canal, which is, uh, and again, the same technique is used to do it proximally, to dilate the canal as you can see. And this is basically a, a blind manipulation. And then uh, there, let's see. Then the whole site is lavaged, irrigated. So the, the retractor endoscopic technique is a little bit different than that, that you introduce the endoscope on a plane above the nerve canal itself. And you don't dilate the nerve canal. You don't enter the nerve canal with uh, bougies or blunt or sharp instruments whatsoever. This is, this is the... This is an example of, a, you know, here I've, I've uh, shown how you can uh, transpose the nerve even. Um, in this, I'm not in agreement with uh, Shimon Rockin and also with Deborah. You, you have to, you have to uh, sacrifice the first or even the first two branches of the FCU in order to transpose the nerve. Otherwise you will not get an adequate transposition. This is number one. Number two, the pain is caused not by the not by the transaction of the <coughs> FCU branches, rather from the uh, antibrachial cutaneous nerve, medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is a sensory nerve, and that causes the that is the culprit which causes severe neuropathic pain problems uh, when it is endured. And here you can see 360 degrees the neuralysis of the nerve is necessary for uh, transposition. And after that, you can see that um, the nerve has been transposed nicely into a cubital fossa and a cubital, um, a, a pocket created in the cubital fossa and stitches placed between the deep fascia and the subcutaneous tissue as shown here will uh, create a septum and that is the original course of the ulnar nerve and that is the new course of the ulnar nerve. And we have to see that it is not being done with kinking. During the surgery, you have to move the elbow completely and see that the nerve does not kink after it has been moved. We did some studies comparing the open techniques and endoscopic techniques. In this study, we compared only the in situ. I showed you the I showed you the anterior transposition just for the image, just to show you that this is possible with the endoscope, not to show you that this has to be done. That is a completely different issue, what we do and uh, whether you transpose or not, whether you transpose subcutaneous or subfascial, or you remove the muscle and put the muscle, or you remove the medial epicondyl. These are discussions which are strategic discussions. Here, I just wanted to show you the endoscopic technique where you can really do it with the endoscope if you want, if you have the next ray. And we compared two cohorts of patients, equal cohorts of patients, with, which have been operated in the endoscopic technique and open technique. And you can see after two years, there is absolutely not big difference between the outcomes. You know, both both uh, groups showed excellent outcome. Uh, and uh, most, of the, most of the people, 60% of the people showed excellent outcomes in both groups. So there is, um, they are comparable. But what is interesting is 
uh, the time to post-op return to full function in the compared groups is much higher in the endoscopic group. That means that the post-operative pain is minimal and they can um, uh, they get back to work quickly and they're, they're mobilized quickly. Um, an important thing here is also to mention that the proper implement, implementation of the technique is important. You, you, you know, in good hands, any technique is good, but like, um, um, uh, like um, Lucas mentioned, uh, Zager KISS is the best option. I mean, keep it very simple, keep it straightforward. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I want to say that the long-term results don't depend on at all on the technique what we use. Uh, short-term results are better with endoscopic releases. So let's come to see the endoscopic technique as a surgical tool required for certain indications. So all around um, the, the, the world, there have been many surgeons had used endoscopic techniques to achieve different goals. And how will you gain expertise if you don't use it? So uh, using it the best, best to begin with simple procedures as in situ decomposition of the ulnar nerve, this gives you uh, a fantastic bird's eye view and an opportunity to use the endoscope and, and decompress it. And when it comes to the, um, once you've gained the expertise in using uh, the endoscopic uh, tool, you start to see the indications when you need to use the endoscope where you can use it or not uh, not as an endoscopic um, uh, technique as a, as a strategy, but use it as a tool. You know, if, if you need a scissor, you use a scissors. If you need a rasp, you take a rasp. If you take a dissector, you take a dissector. Or lehi, you take a lehi. Same way, whenever you see there is a necessity, you take the endoscope and use it for the indications as you see in history. Thank you very much. I'll keep my uh, talk. Anyway. Karthik, thank you very much for this excellent overview and for reminding us that uh, endoscopical techniques is an enhancement of what we have to, to treat these patients. So um, we now will start the discussion. There's one question or two questions uh, from Dr. Gavrilins. Um, he asks, arm surgeons usually use maximum decompression technique, decompression all possible compression sites, not only cubital. Is, it, is this necessary or not? So go, um, as was proposed when introducing the endoscopic techniques, the, the, the argument to do it was to have a, well, a long distance decompression for about 10 to 12 centimeters, starting at the cubital tunnel, proximal and distal. Um, and that has now over years been reduced to, well, more or less the cubital tunnel plus maybe five to 10 centimeters. So this is the first question, go for all. And the second is, what is your opinion of combination when um, uh, decompress the nerve to augment inside the cubital canal formed by a muscle roof attached to the medial epicondyle? Uh, does it help from instability? So basically to prevent secondary um, uh, hypermobility after in situ decompression. So what's your opinion on this? Kartik, will you, you want to start? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the stimulating questions. <clears throat> uh, the comment to the first question is, um, there is, there is no necessity to decompress the nerve in a very, very long stretch. Uh, it was, um, the, the studies which were presented at that time was just to justify, it is quite a natural thing, just to justify their new technique, a new tool which has been brought into the uh, scenario and to say that, look, this tool offers something which if you want to do in an open fashion, you have to open up a very long distance. And they tried to impress upon us and saying that, look, with the endoscopic technique, you can really decompress in a long distance without uh, making a long incision. And, uh, and this is necessary. This is actually necessary to do the, uh, do the decompression. But I personally yeah. also studies have shown that it is not really necessary to do the decompression at such a long distance is number one. Number two, double crush and other um, uh, uh, issues have been brought up. Uh, both by Shimon Rockin and also by other panelists, 
about whether to operate the double crush right away. There is a large degree on and a cubital tunnel syndrome. Do we need to uh, do it both? I yes, I would. I would if it is if it has been electrophysiologically uh, tested and um, uh, and and uh, proven as well as. Um, there is tunnel sign on both sides and the patient has atrophy of the hand intrinsics, then I would go in and do, uh, I will go even one step further and I will tell you a, a, a short anecdote of my fellowship with uh, Dr. David Klein. Um, he uh, visited us uh, when I was in Gießen and we operated together a case of a huge lipoma of the uh, forearm in the volars aspect. So um, I removed the lipoma. It was quite a straightforward case. Um, but then David said, go on and decompress the distal part of the uh, carpal tunnel. It is, it is always, because once you do such, such manipulations, the distal part is gonna swell up and there are gonna be some, um, some tissue swelling. And he found it necessary that a distal decompression is important, especially when you do manipulations. So I also advocate this to our trauma surgeons when they put in plates in the distal part of the radius. It is rather a good idea to go and, and decompress the carpal tunnel in order to prevent post-operative uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and worsening the nerve conduction possibilities. I hope this answers all the questions and I hope I'm forgotten. Well, the, the other question was the, you know, the, the creating somewhat like a, um, uh, uh, an obstacle to, to, to have hypermobility after simple in, uh, in situ decompression. I personally would completely refrain to do it because yes. of the scarring, because you need to cut a muscle and suture it. So you will create scar and you yeah. will create most probably a secondary, or at least there's the risk of cre creating a secondary compression oh. site. You know, let, if, it is, if it is going to subluxate, as long as it does not create clinical problems it doesn't matter it, it can't even subluxate it so as long as it doesn't snap there is going to be some movement as um, as shown by Giovanni Cocco that uh, the movement is always going to be there you know because nerves should glide nerves should glide so it, that, that also brings us to the issue that soon after the surgery we have to mobilize the joint we have to get the patient's move so the, the thought that we have to put the elbow in a cast like many orthopedic surgeons do in our area, this is outdated and it is, it is not correct. It even injures the nerve. When the nerve gets tethered in its new place with new scarring, that's gonna create more problems. So that's why I encourage my patients to move the elbow to do the physio right away. Absolutely agree. So uh, thank you, Kartik. So one of the, uh, I think one of the most controversial uh, statements was uh, by Deborah, and this was again uh, the, the, well, the, the idea to come up with this webinar is to, uh, there are uh, even guidelines, at least in Germany, for the treatment of cubital tunnel uh, uh, syndrome. And most of the work is based on one of the most experienced peripheral nerve surgeons we have here. And he has done thousands of uh, ulnar decompression, which is Hans Asmus. And he basically came back to the Zeger principle to kiss, to keep it as simple as possible. And he, uh, and this is what we, uh, even with uh, literature and with uh, all the uh, experienced colleagues involved in the generation of the, and then the generating of the, guidelines agreed that even if the nerve is hypermobile, we will not go uh, at first sight for uh, transposition. So this is maybe some seven, eight years old. And uh, Deborah stated uh, that in her, uh, according to her experience done in the UA, that her uh, way to treat changes. So is this something that is uh, yeah. true for others too? Debra, please. Okay, so the experience I presented is a partial experience because I just focus on the patients that I have diagnosed and treated in the last year. And uh, maybe because, you know, you always try to, um, to keep the presentation as short as possible. 
I have not indulged in saying that I also, um, of course, have performed a simple in situ decompression as first choice technique for many years. And I just started to um, change my uh, technique more recently when I started to see that the percentage of patients presented an hypermobility of the ulnar nerve um, uh, was relevant. And again, uh, maybe we also have to consider what is the lifestyle of the patients. Um, uh, young patients are using a lot the smartphones, which means that they uh, spend a long time with the prolonged elbow flexion. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned also, most of my patients were young males um, and um, I might even say kind of rather obsessed with um, being fit and therefore uh, weightlifting um, uh, was um, a major concern for them. Um, so um, it, it's probably a small sample of the population, but one thing is clear, um, patients uh, with a different kind of lifestyle with those that I used to treat, for instance, when I was in Italy or even years ago. And I think the point, uh, and, and this was the, my message, I think we also have to, to say, so update uh, the technique, and we have also to consider that we have to tailor um, our procedures based uh, on the new conditions of the patients. Uh, um, I can tell you that um, most of my patients uh, report, uh, um, uh, doctor, when I uh, keep my elbow flexed, uh, I see that immediately I have a worsening of the algoparesthesias. Uh, so there is a clear also evidence, that, and, and I can hear the click of the nerve. Uh, so, you know, this for me is an evidence that the ulnar hypermobility is not a situation that we should um, underestimate. For sure, we need more evidence, but um, I think we have to consider that most of the reports in the literature um, also date back to before we started to do an assessment that would include electrodiagnostic studies uh, and um, uh, imaging. So the, the hypermobility was probably not preoperatively assessed. There was a, a different uh, lifestyle. Um, so, you know, for, for me, I'm not saying that I want to um, oblige everybody to go for uh, anterior subcutaneous transposition as first choice, but I think that probably we have to consider um, there are new conditions and maybe we should consider that was what was valid uh, as a statement uh, 15 years ago might not be valid anymore now. Thank you very much. I think this is very important to, to point out that the dynamic studies, especially with ultrasound, give us insight into pathologies we not have seen this way before. Um, so what I, what I ask myself is, is the hypermobility the actual problem? Because you can see an epineurial scarring at the point where the nerve, uh, let's say, rubs around the, the medial epicondyle or is the uh, anterior transposition, as you showed, Deborah, in your uh, presentation, that the nerve is less stretched once you flex the arm completely, if it runs around the, the cubital fossa or if it runs, if it's transposed. So is it also a problem of less stretching of the nerve? What do you, is there any opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think that this is also one of the major reasons why these patients also um, do better when they have the anterior transposition. For somebody that spends, for instance, uh, 10 hours uh, uh, typing on a computer and therefore with prolonged elbow flexion, or for instance, if they have the habit of sleeping, uh, with, uh, with um, um, flex elbows, uh, uh, the stretching might be uh, a major factor triggering uh, the, the onset of the symptoms uh, and, um, and the transposition as this advantage as well. So there's one more question from Dr. Zitek. This goes for Kartik mostly. Any conditions that prevent using endoscopy? topic technique to you, Kartik. Is there anything, uh, condition you would say, no, in this case, I will go for open. Um, actually, again, I'm, I'm coming back to my comment about using the endoscope as a tool. It is not an endoscopic technique of transposition. Uh, so you can basically begin any surgery with an endoscopic approach. And as soon as you see that the scarring is too high, uh, there's going to be additional pathology, which you're not going to be um, uh, approach with the endoscope, you can either do a second incision and go on from that part uh, using the endoscope or you open up. 
So scarring and additional uh, pathology. For example, many, many years ago, Shimon Rokin presented a fantastic uh, video in one of her meetings where he showed um, how he used the endoscope to detect shrapnel injuries down uh, a nerve when his exposure was limited to one area. And that is something which uh, would not, I would not take out shrapnels uh, located in far areas using the endoscope rather open and do it under, under sight. This is something which is important to me. So scarring, additional pathology, these are the two basic indications where I would switch over from endoscopy to open procedure. And don't shunt to do that. Thank you, Kartik. So are there any comments on this from, from the panelists? And um, there's a comment from Dr. Forster. Inching studies in neurophysiology pre-op and in theater showing nerve function and localized entrapment focal damage. Klein showed the value of this years ago. Any current uses? So any intra-op uh, monitoring during uh, ulnar nerve um, surgery. And uh, Klein would show exactly where the conduction would, would have been compromised. But this is true. This technique, I guess, is really uh, rarely used. So I personally... In the ulnar nerve uh, surgeries, I personally, I use the stimulation, but not uh, monitoring. So no NAPs and no SSAPs or anything. How about the others? Same thing for me. We generally use intraoperative electrophysiological monitoring, practically for all kinds of peripheral nerve surgery. And especially, of course, for ulnar nerve entrapment or another kind of entrapment. It's very, it's very helpful. It's helpful for us to clearly understand if it's completely released. You know, in situ, in situ release, it's simple releases. Everyone can do this, but it's not so simple. Very important to release in three points of the possible compression or to be sure that it's completely free. And electrophysiology help during the surgery to understand if you, if you release on the nerve. In most of the cases, you have intraoperative improvement of intra-electrophysiological response. Directly, of course, you need good electrophysiology specialist because it's difficult for a surgeon to do also electrophysiology and also to operate patient. But uh, intraoperative electrophysiology is necessary, uh, practically, and also is uh, 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 you know in last 30 years excluded maybe few separate cases. We don't operate any any case with uh, anterior transfer in case of if a. Uh, Ulnar nerve, pure ulnar nerve entrapment, not traumatic and not heterogenic and not residual. Of course, I completely agree with Deborah. In cases of traumatic injury, in cases of heterogenic injury or residual, is it in most of the cases necessary to perform in a anterior transposition. But in pure, in the first surgery, is direct decompression, delicate direct decompression with intraoperative response, with good electrodiagnosis before surgery injury, and of course ultrasound obsession is necessary because I would ask for a, for a panel case, young men have clinical picture, ulnar nerve entrapment, ultrasound normal, EMG normal, he suffered in last six months, is he have a problem with quality of life a spine is a, no problem is a, a MRI is normal, no problem is have a clinical picture with stenal, not atrophy, hypoesthesia. So what you what you are going to do with this case? EMG normal, ultrasound normal, only clinical picture, six months, no improvement. I would go for surgery. Well, in situ, for my side, surgery. Yeah. Simple in situ decompression. Yes, I completely agree with you. He, this is a, a patient, try all kinds of medication, it's a, a swimming pool, not any psychological problems. After surgery, dramatic improvement. Dramatic improvement in his condition. In situ release, of course. 
what we left out was the the revision surgery, which is I think a huge uh, topic in ulnar nerve, because uh, we all know the cases of people with ulnar nerve having uh, that have been operated on twice or even three times, and there's uh, has been an anterior subcutaneous transposition, so there's no there's also scar tissue, same as for the cubital tunnel. So um, uh, David Klein was already mentioned and Learman too with a muscular um, transposition. Um, so is this limited to uh, secondary procedures? Because I know that David Klein with quite a success used it for primary too. I remember when Thomas Kretschmer came back, back from him to, to Gunzburg, he introduced this technique and the people were happy with it although they need of course a longer time to to regenerate because of the more invasiveness Karthik, please you see um the thing is i just keep coming back to this issue again and again it is it is the action between the technique and the strategy what you decide so i have seen many a times patients who come to me with a very small incision where they say there have been anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve having been done, and you see obviously a kink of the nerve. The nerve has not been released proximal enough. The nerve has not been released distal enough, and the um, and the transposition was just nothing but a worse kinking of the nerve just around the epicondyle, around the medial epicondyle. This is something which has to be. So if you put all these patients into that basket and say that anterior transposition, is it good or bad? It is bad, of course, it is bad. So if an anterior transposition is properly made or an in situ decompression has been properly made, then the results are gonna be different. So we cannot label completely and say that anterior transposition is bad. It doesn't work. Absolutely agree. So I think what we all need to keep in mind is that even if it doesn't seem to be complex surgery, but uh, what we learned during this webinar is that we can do a lot of harm if we are not working in a meticulous way in all levels. So uh, I think whenever a technique is well performed, the patient most probably will benefit from it. And of course, we need to choose the less invasive one with, with the best effect. So I completely agree to not, you know, stigmatize one of the uh, techniques, but to keep in mind all of them and pick the right choose choice for every patient. So I would like if there are no more questions, I can see the, the new part shift. We, you know, I don't agree with Deborah. We, we, we have these things nowadays. These things, these things. People use the earphones. They don't. They don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore. Maybe the people, some people sleep like that. We'll so, see. In, well, let's have one. Uh, we can repeat the webinar in two years and see the effects of the earpods. Absolutely. Sponsored by Apple and <laughs> or, Samsung. <laughs> or maybe Corona. Or maybe Corona. <laughs> Deborah, please. You want um, to make the final remarks. The final remark is that we all only wanted to prove that ulnar nerve entrapment is not such a simple pathology as many believe. Um, that um, the fact that already we have so many surgical techniques and uh, at the end of the day, um, quite a few surgeons are discussing and we do not find an agreement on which technique might be the best one, probably implies that still we have to learn a lot. My personal message was that um, we, as I said before, we really need to tailor the diagnostic assessment and consequently the indication for surgery. Maybe there is something which is changing in comparison with the past. And, um, and probably we still need to review the results uh, also with longer follow-ups that we, we, we did before. And uh, I agree with you that we should have included also the revision surgery, but you know we had um, limitation related to time. And, uh, and this is the reason why at the end of the day, the, the main message was about the, the diagnosis and, and the indication. Uh, but since it seems that the, the topic was interesting for quite a few of the participants, maybe we can actually 
uh, do a second part uh, and uh, rediscuss some of the concepts uh, that we already mentioned today and also analyze them at the light of the revision surgery. Uh, so we will conclude this webinar. So thank you once again, Deborah and uh, Simon. And yeah, thanks to course. everybody and all the speakers involved and all the participants all the, for the fruitful discussion. And um, we will keep you updated for the next activities with our web webinar series, which will be in more or less six weeks, six to seven weeks. So good night and see you Thank next you time. Guys.